Hi, welcome to another look at the book of Proverbs. We're in Proverbs chapter 8 today. We'll be starting in verse 6. If you'd like to open your Bible and turn there. I'm Clark Dunlap, and I'm teaching this uh, along with the uh, the Lifeway uh, Bible lessons, okay, for Sunday school. Now, Proverbs chapter 8. Up to this point, Solomon has been talking about two women, okay? They're make-believe women, but they're pretty real. The first, we first saw back in uh, chapter 1, verse 20, is this woman who calls out in the street, and her name is Wisdom. She calls in the streets and in the markets and in the city gates, offering wisdom for everyone who hears, okay? And then in chapter 2, verse 16, we're introduced to the forbidden woman or the strange woman, the adulteress who is out to uh, seduce and trap people. They're out and about in the streets and in the marketplaces. But rather than calling out in the streets, she's more apt to lie in wait, more apt to speak words of flattery and temptation. Now, it's kind of obvious who these two women represent, right? One represents the wisdom of God, and the other, the folly of his enemy. But which one do we listen to? Which one are you listening to? Let me ask this a different way. Which one did you listen to before you learned to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I know personally, I wasn't listening to the wisdom of God near as much as I should. Okay? Now, in spite of this graphic description we have of this forbidden woman, uh, her temptations, they're not all about sex, okay? That's what it seems to be. And, and remember, Solomon began by addressing a son and his sons, plural. He is raising up future leaders here. And these are young men, and they need a good, strong warning about loose women, okay? But that's not all that she's talking about. Temptation and, and forbidden things. Aren't we all tempted at times? Men, women, young, old. We're tempted to have things that we're not supposed to have. We all have desires for different things. The Apostle John reminds us in, in 1 John chapter 2 that for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the uh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. These are things that get our attention. Maybe they're sparkly. <laughs> you know, things that we want. We like, I'd like some of that. They're things that appeal to our physical pleasure. Boy, that would make my life so much easier. Yeah, God may not want me to have that, but I want it. Or things that make us look good to others. The pride of life. You know, we want we want to uh, appear to be really on top of our game to everybody. So we heard all about this forbidden woman back in chapter 5 through 7. But now we're going to hear from wisdom herself starting in verse 6 of Proverbs chapter 8. Follow along in verse 6, if you would. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instructions instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you desire cannot compare with her. In verse six, she says, listen, listen to me. I'm going to make some things 
some important things real obvious to you. I think that's the idea behind noble here, okay? Now, some translations have excellent things, and I don't think that's wrong, but I think there's a, an idea that maybe excellent doesn't capture. This word that's translated noble or excellent really refers to what we call the nobles, kings, generals, governors, princes, the nobles, okay? And and that's as a noun, but when it's used then as an as an adjective, you're saying these things are noble, these things are are obvious, but have value and they're right and gonna put them right in front of you, okay? And they're valuable things. They're prominent. They are, they are notable. And, and when she says all that, she says, and, they're notable, and I only say what is right. Now, does that mean she's just always correct? She's always got her facts straight? Well, she does, but it really has more of a moral implication. What she says is righteous, okay? It's always the right thing in, in a moral sense, okay? And then in verse 7 and 8, I want to point out a, a little bit about a Hebrew poetic device. We see one in the idea of personifying wisdom and making it into a person that speaks to us as wisdom personified. And he makes it a woman, and that sort of counterbalances the forbidden woman of temptation. Okay, And so that is one poetic device. Uh, there, there's no need to deify this woman of called wisdom, all right? It's not a person like the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. That what we have, this uh, personification of wisdom as a, as a device. But then there's this other device. There's a lot of them in Hebrew poetry. But the one we see in 7 and 8 is called an antithetical parallelism. Those are my big words of the day, right there. Antithetical because they, they seem almost opposite of the opposite sides of a coin, but not really opposite in, in disagreeing with each other, okay? Uh, she's trying to say something positive, but then she follows that with a negative statement that reinforces the positive statement. For instance, if I was telling you something, I would say, I'm telling the truth. That's a positive statement. Then I could say, I'm not lying. Well, with the not in there, that's kind of the negative side, but it, it agrees with the fact that I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. So that's the sign of thing she says in verse seven. She said, I will utter truth. Then then she says, wickedness is detestable to my lips. My lips hate wickedness. Well, that also informs us what she means by truth here. I will utter truth in righteousness the opposite of wickedness. So I'm going to utter righteous truth, and my lips hate wickedness. In verse 8, all my words are righteous. Then, the, the negative side, there is nothing crooked or perverse in them. You see, that that's a little... Uh, Hebrew poetry device, they get into a rhythm. They're not so much talking about uh, uh, a rhyme on every other line or or so many syllables per meter, the iambic pentameter and all that. They have different ways of, of doing poetry and, and they, they go with thoughts to a large degree. Now they use some other things too, but this is one of the things they do. Uh, so they have these two antitheticals Okay, and then in verse nine, it's sort of a, a synthetic parallelism. They, they 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 work together. They fuse together. They uh, she says of her words, her wisdom, they are all straight to those of understanding. In other words, people who who understand the wisdom that I'm sharing, they'll see that my words are straightforward. They're right. You can you can use them. They're like straight as a ruler, okay? And then uh, they are right to those who find knowledge. Those who are seeking knowledge will discover that, that my wisdom is good wisdom. You can, you can understand it. 
So what's the point of all this that she has to say in describing her wisdom this way? The point is, you can trust it. You can count on it. You can, you can rest in the knowledge that wisdom is going to steer you in the right way. And if you're seeking wisdom, it's going to seem right to you. You're going to say, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. But there's another implication in all this. And stop and look at the big picture for a second. These words of wisdom are actually the words of God. Are they not? I mean, wisdom, true wisdom, righteous wisdom, moral wisdom, perfect wisdom comes from God and God alone. And you can trust the word of God. That's the implication we see here. Not just the book of Proverbs. Everything that God says is dependable. You can trust the word of God. It will guide you into righteousness and guide you away from wickedness. You know, even if some of the Proverbs in this book are, are seen in literature from other cultures, even if some of them uh, reflect or sound a lot like the wisdom from other cultures, listen, all truth is God's truth. And you can depend on God's truth. If God included it in this book, it's his truth. Okay? Other people have discovered truth and, and wisdom. But if it's God's, you can definitely count on it. Now, it doesn't mean everybody out there saying this is God's truth and tells you something. Well, be wary. They can say it's God's truth. It doesn't mean it is. It needs to go along with what you read in the Word of God. And this is something we need to apply, especially in a day like this, a, a day of, of a lot of political speech, a day in a lot of social speech with all the things that are going on in our world. There's probably some truth in some of that, but it needs to line up with God's Word. You need to be wary just because they tell you it's truth doesn't mean it is truth. Does it match what God says? So there's an implication here. You can trust God in all that he says. Now, in verse 10, it's a little tweak of a change. It's in this section uh, right at the end of this first section uh, where she's talking about uh, her value. Okay. Then she says in verse 10, take my instructions. Now, this is a command. She's gone from just information and description. She's gone to a command to take her instruction. This word suggests seizing, laying a hold of something or even embracing. You know, if you like that picture better than seizing, it, it's, it's saying yes to this. OK, now, how do we do that? Well, first, we have to value God's wisdom. You're not going to seize what you don't value. If this is just, just so much words to you, it doesn't mean a whole lot, you're not going to lay hold of it. You need to have a mind change and say, you know what? I'm going to value what God has to say. So we have to value it, and then we have to lay hold of it, read it, learn it, apply it, keep it in front of us, okay? Continue to value it even after you receive it. And understand that it is better than gold and silver and jewels. In fact, nothing I desire compares with wisdom, okay? And so wisdom keeps talking then in this next section and explaining why she is so valuable. She's going to bring a lot to the table, okay? Wisdom has some friends. So let's look at wisdom's friends. Follow with me in chapter, I mean, in, in verse 12 through 16. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel, sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. They do it by wisdom. So she's got some good friends here. If you want 
to get wisdom, you're also going to get prudence and knowledge and discretion. Now you're thinking, great. Man, I was just thinking the other day, I need some prudence in my life. Well, let's take a look at these. Let's be serious about that. Let's say these all, especially the, the idea of prudence and discretion, they suggest something else. They suggest that with wisdom comes the knowledge of how to act in given situations. Now, it's one thing. Remember, Solomon is a king and he's teaching his sons. It's one thing to learn how to act at a state dinner. You know, which fork to use first. Don't, don't drink the water that's in your finger bowl. Silly things like that. Okay, maybe that's really not what Solomon is so concerned about. Maybe Solomon has other things in mind that he's trying to teach these future leaders of Israel. Like how to spot a traitor. What to do with a deceiver? How do you deal with anything from criticism all the way to an uprising or a revolt? How do you deal with these things? Well, these words, prudence and discretion, we can look those up and say, okay, those are good things to have. But they can also be translated with words like crafty and shrewd. You know, it's okay to be crafty and shrewd. If you don't sin, in fact, it's like being it's it's like being the opposite of gullible and naive. It's okay to not be gullible and naive, okay? And Jesus said in Matthew ten sixteen, he said to his disciples, he said, "Listen, or behold, I am sending you out as sheep among the wolves." Um, Jesus was so setting them up. You're, gonna, you're my sheep, but I'm sending you out where the wolves are. So be wise as serpents, but harmless or innocent as a dove. It's okay to be wise as a serpent. In fact, we need to be wiser than the serpent, okay? But innocent as doves. This is how kings and princes and rulers and nobles or to rule in a godly manner. This is something we can pray for our leaders. How can they be wise? How can they rule with wisdom, with craftiness? How can they be shrewd and yet rule in a godly fashion? I don't know if we have a single ruler out there in our country that's thinking along these terms, but we can pray for them. We can pray that they would be that kind of a ruler. And then this last section we're going to get into tells us something else. She's, wisdom has said she's valuable. Well, wisdom has told us she brings a lot to the table. She has these things that she can help us with. But now she says, I'm obtainable. You can get wisdom. Okay. Look at verses 17 through 21. Follow along. I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the path of righteousness, in the path of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. Now, wisdom had told us there in verse 10, you need to embrace my wisdom, okay? But now she says, I love those who love me. You know, that, that almost sounds like she's saying, I only love you if you love me first. But wisdom this this woman wisdom here is a reflection of the wisdom of God. And we know that the that's not God. That's not how God is. In 1 John chapter 4, John teaches us that, that herein is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. We only love him because he first loved us. And so that's not what she's saying here. She's not disagreeing with that. 
And then what's this bit about seeking? Those that seek me. Well, the Apostle Paul quoted King David when he said, no man seeks after God. Did you know that just doesn't happen on our own? But now man can love. Man can seek, but only when God loves first. Only when God calls first. Only when God seeks you first can we then love God and seek God. You see, God is showing his love for us when he enables us to love him and to seek him. And this verse says to seek him diligently and we will find him. And as we love him because he first loved us, as we begin to seek him because he called our name, then we experience that reward of the love and acceptance of God Almighty when we choose to love him. Okay? So so this is this is in keeping with the whole teaching of the Bible. This is not a contradictory thing. God does love us first. And as we respond to his love, we experience the love of our Father. Okay? So here's my question. Have you experienced that call to come to him? Do you know what that means? I don't mean, did you just hear a preacher tell you to come to God? Did you read it in a book? I mean, has this truth that God is calling you to himself, has that gripped your heart? Has that gripped your mind? Have you been compelled to come to Christ? Is there a longing to be right with God that didn't used to be there? Have you experienced this? Because if you're just now becoming aware that you need this, or maybe it's beginning to be birthed in you, this idea that, yes, I need to come to Christ. I need, I need to come to him and repent and, and trust him. Well, then you need to do that right now. Call on his love to forgive you, to forgive you of sin, to forgive you of not living your life according to his wisdom. Okay, which is sin. Ask him to save you from the results of your sin. The biggest one, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Have him rescue you. Ask him, save me from eternal death, O oh God. Give me eternal life. Save me from the results of my sin. And if you've done that, and you've received his forgiveness. You also receive his very spirit of God taking up residence within you, beginning to change your life, work on you from inside out. Now, if you've done that, you know that this wisdom comes with these other things that he just talked about right here, like in verse 18, where he says, riches and honor, wealth and righteousness. Now, when you see riches and wealth, you might jump to a conclusion, okay? Don't jump to that. Don't think that God is just promising you money for trusting in him. That's not what this is talking about. Remember, he just said that money and gold and silver and jewels are not worthy to be compared to him. He's worth, wisdom is worth, she is worth more than all of that. Now, I'm not saying that God never blesses us financially. He can and does. He helps meet our physical needs. But we get the riches of his grace. I think Paul latched on to this idea in Proverbs when he wrote that letter to the Ephesians. He uses that phrase like three times, Ephesians 1, 7 and 2, 7. The riches of his grace. And then he says we receive honor. Now, it's one thing to, that God arranged for us to be receive the honor of men. That's nice. But you know what? I want the honor of God. Not, not because I'm uh, perfect or anything. No. But, but God will honor those that honor him. In 1 Samuel 4.20, 20. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. The honor of God 
can be ours, that God honors us with his presence, with his gifts, with his riches and grace. That's just humbling. That almost breaks my heart to think God honors us. Riches and honor then are paralleled by wealth and righteousness. And that word wealth in Hebrew really refers to God seeing to our good. Now he can see to our good financially or physically or in healing or in health or in spiritual blessings and all these different things. But but I think what we see is it's the big picture that God sees to the good of his people what they need most. And God knows what we need most and we need to trust him. It's not up to us to tell you, well, right now, God, I could you could keep the grace a little bit. I, I need some more money. No, that's not how that works. God will decide for our good. We have that promise in Romans 8, 28, that all things work to, to, uh, for the better to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. So that's the concept here. And why these things? Because they're better than gold and silver. The wisdom we receive from God guides us in righteousness and justice. And he says there that we will have his inheritance. Isn't that wonderful? It's not over all here. There, there's more besides. It's not over when we die. There's an inheritance beyond the grave. And he will fill their storehouses, their treasuries. He will fill. It could even be like a basement, that word. <laughs> but he will fill. He will make sure we have all we need. And once again, yes, he can supply our physical needs. But he gives us so much grace. When we come to Christ, we find this wisdom calling to us like this wise woman in the streets. But wisdom calls us to find the one who is wisdom, the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes from the Father. Do you have that wisdom? Have you heard that call? God bless.